happens to all the data when you die? The stuff like your Google searches, files in your emails, all that information on your phone. We're talking with Carl Ullman, author of the new book, The Afterlife of Data, What Happens to Your Information When You Die and Why You Should Care. And he's with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, I think that's a good place to start. Why should we care? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's a common question, of course. It's like you know, uh, it's not like you're going to be too bothered yeah, about yeah. what you uh, after you die. Uh, but my my answer is usually that it's very difficult to tease out one person's data from another person's data. These are all networked clusters of data. So let's say that you're a very private person. You don't use the internet. You don't use any technologies really. But your mother did, and your father did, and maybe your siblings did, and all your friends did, which means that a company that doesn't have necessarily access to any of your data can use the network data to actually tease out a lot of information about you. So it's really a matter of the data of the dead, the privacy of the dead, is also the privacy of the living. Hmm. What about the people who have social media accounts, which have some followers, and and, you know, sometimes someone might run that. I've seen that, you know, like after an actor dies, someone else is running their account or something like that. How does that get monetized? Do you leave your social media to someone in your will? Yeah, I mean, so plenty of services. So Facebook, we're actually uh, pioneers in this. Uh, they have a service. You, you can just log into settings uh, and you can choose a legacy contact. So that would be another Facebook user that has access to your profile and can actually edit things and, and be kind of a moderator uh, through the, the, the various posts that you know people can upload photos on you and they can edit comments and so on. Uh, but it's actually becoming a huge financial burden as well. We're talking about billions uh, of, of profiles in the next couple of decades. Uh, and of course, like all of tech runs on targeted ads and dead people naturally don't really click on any ads, yet they take up server space nevertheless. Mm. So the question of the day is gonna be, well, what do you do with these heaps of data? Are we going to destroy them? Are they gonna be kept? Are they gonna be monetized in some way? So is, there, is that the reason why somebody would want to put my life together and keep it going is that so that they can fool advertising companies into saying, look, I got another consumer for you. Is that it? I don't understand why else they would care. So data are commonly used, like your, your personal data, no offense, would not necessarily be super interesting right. to any particular firm, but it may be a part of a larger data center or a larger data set that can be used to train new AI models, for instance. So in order to train models, in order to predict, like what would a white man in Northern United States want to purchase? Like what are their behaviors like? You need very uh, large quantities of data to be order to train a model into predicting what a mm -hmm. certain individual might want or, or click sure. on and so forth. So is there going to be some regulation on this coming up that, you know, once you this stuff gets shut out and they don't have access to your data after you die? Yeah, so sadly, like uh, the dead don't really have any strong lobbying groups in Brussels or in Washington. Uh, so as of currently, like most data protection legislation actually explicitly leaves out any data protection rights for the dead. So I live in Europe, for instance, where the, the big uh, data regulation uh, legislation is called the GDPR. And it explicitly states that, you know, this is one of the strictest data protection legislations in the world. But the moment you die, all of your rights ceases, uh, cease immediately. Okay, but so now that we know about this because of you, and we may be troubled by this, and knowing that big tech is usually ahead of the curve compared to our lawmakers, is there something that we can do to protect ourselves from having our stuff stolen after we die? Well, so, like, I, I would point to three very basic things. The, the first thing would be to, if you're on social media, if you're on Facebook, for instance, go on and just explore their their legacy features like choose a legacy contact it will save your uh, your next of kin so much time and effort and trouble uh if you've already set it up beforehand and the second thing would be get in touch with uh with your lawyer uh it's also one of those really simple things to do 
in Swedish, uh, we have a concept called, uh, I might live in Sweden, I should mention, uh, we have a concept called death cleaning. Uh, it means t t tidying up your house, setting your things in order so that if you die, no one else has to bother with, you know, going through all of your possessions. I think something similar should apply to the online world as well. Just make an inventory of where do you have set up accounts? Where have you left your data? Uh, and inform your lawyer about that and, and make sure to put it in your will. But right. The third, I think, oh. arguably most important mm -hmm. thing, this is what the book is primarily about, is to try to think of your data not just as a private matter. It's not just a question of what do you want to happen to your data when you die, but it's a collective matter. It's a matter of what do we want mm. to our data as a society. So think of this not just as a consumer, but rather maybe as a citizen. Gotcha. The book is The Afterlife of Data, What Happens to Your Information When You Die and Why You Should Care. You can follow Carl on X. Thanks for being with us.